on today's episode of Gathering the Kings. When those warning signs are on, that warning light on the dashboard's on, blinking, right? <laughs> is Whatever amount of money is on the other side of that finish line is almost never worth the, the brain damage it, it takes to get there. Because along the way, it becomes a distraction, generally, and it takes you away, takes me away at least, from looking and listening for those good opportunities with customers that care about us. You are listening to Gathering the Kings with Chaz Wolf, featuring fellow seven, eight, and even nine figure business owners who have real battle scars from business and life, but have prevailed as the king that they are designed to be. We welcome high performing entrepreneurs to the stage in order to reveal the real of the real on what it takes to build a successful business today. We dissect the good and bad decisions they've made along the way that give a true and accurate picture of the journey of success and how you too can get there. Through this dialogue, you will learn the value of growing your network and surrounding yourself with power players and kings like today's guest. Grab your pen and notebook because we're about to dive in. What's up everybody, I'm Chaz Wolf, Gathering the Kings podcast. We're back with you today. Barry Wurzel here on the King stage. My brother, how you doing? Hey, good, thanks. How are you? I'm wonderful, and I appreciate you being here. Monday morning, we were just talking about us both doing some skiing here in the next couple of days. I'm excited that we both get to get a little powder underneath the feet, huh? Yeah, we'll be close proximity-wise anyway. That's right. That's right, in comparison. <clears throat> well, Barry, I just so appreciate your time and, and you being here. This is actually a unique episode for us because we had your wife on the show, gosh, probably two, three, four months ago maybe. And, mm -hmm. uh, and you guys just have some incredible businesses and uh, she gave some awesome perspective from some operational side of things. And I just had to get, I had to get the vision. I had to get the man, the myth, the legend on here on the show. So Barry, thanks for being here. Why don't you remind us what kind of businesses that you guys have? We have, uh, well, we have a service company an HVAC plumbing electric service company focuses, focuses almost solely on residential service. We have a, a concrete cutting demolition firm and a general contracting firm that performs only private commercial construction. There you go. A lot of, a lot of things going on in your world. Mm -hmm. I appreciate you stepping away from those things for, for a little bit of time here to give some of the listeners some, some value, but Barry, tell us, tell us why you do this. I mean, you just mentioned a lot. I know you got family and, and all this other stuff going on outside of the businesses. What's your, what's your bigger picture? What, what's the why for you? Well, the why for Wurzel, the general contracting business is I'm a builder at heart. And when I was little, well, when I was little, I, you know, always built models and figured out how to build things out of whatever I could find in the garage. But yeah. uh, I'm just really, I guess, a true builder. And uh, when we started Wurzel Builders in 1998, that was just my opportunity to go try it on my own and see if I can continue to uh, build things and hopefully make a difference in the way the business is or the way the construction industry is is managed from a general contracting perspective. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, you <clears throat> kind of hit on two things there. I want to dive into a little bit more, but you being a builder at heart, I think that that is an identity that uh, maybe that you and I are similar in that way. But, uh, and then I also heard you say that you're an industry dis disruptor a little bit, you know, an industry that you thought maybe was being done in a certain way. And you thought, well, you know, if I can impact that, that might be good. And so mm -hmm. I'd just be curious on that, on that industry disruption. And what, what do you think that, you or what value do you think that you've brought or what was about the general contracting industry that you wanted to change or that you wanted to upgrade like what are some of those things to give us give us some thoughts there <clears throat> well before i went out on my own i guess a good example is of this is before i went out on my own worked for a company the president of the company was kind of a hardliner if you will and his way of doing things i'm not gonna say it was wrong but it sure wasn't very user-friendly and so, and at times you can't always be user friendly, but he seemed to pull the trigger in that space before trying to really be intentional and connect with somebody to work through a problem. And he and I were on a, on a trip to a project once and we were talking and, and about a topic. And I just remember thinking, you know, we are the, we are decision makers and we can purposely change our behavior to be more, more of a team player, more collaborative and solve a problem. So. Right. I just at the time, it's interesting because at that time I knew I was already going to go out on my own. <clears throat> so that's a, that's a lesson. Of course, I've dealt with people like that since right. many business, other owners, for example. Yeah. And so I, I remember that often that uh, even though the hard line is sometimes the path you need to take, I always search for the solution first and 
and you know, work with the end of mind and work with the work, try to find a, a collaborative way to solve the problem. In most, in most situations, that's possible. Sometimes yeah. not, but mostly yes. Yeah, I love that perspective because you're right. In, I think, construction in general, there's a, a lot of the hard line. But oftentimes, just in business, doesn't really, I mean, kind of across a lot of industries, there are hard drivers. And that's what makes us successful a lot of times is that we've just we've just pushed hard enough <laughs> through through the, you know, through the ick of business. But I love the 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 language of collaborative, problem solving, you know, looking to modify yourself as a leader to be able to to be, you know, aware of those that you're working with. And so what do you think? I guess other than that scenario here, like What's the value of being collaborative or or problem solving as opposed to the hard line? What have, what have you seen? Because it seems like you're far the other way. What's the value of it doing doing it this way? Well, if you, uh, probably at least two things. I'm sure there's, I know there's more than that, but mainly if you can collaborate, we're not, even if you think that you've done everything right, all of us, you know, are flawed. We all make mistakes and yeah. And most things we do. And so to take the hard line and not look to, for the collaborative approach is, can't think of the right word right now, but it's just seems a little bit. It's silly. just not. It just doesn't. It's to, to be collaborative is to have show the grace, have the grace, and and look for the path to solve the problem together. And the benefit there is is that yeah. we might both be wrong. Shoot, even they may be wrong, or maybe I'm mostly wrong. But at least by having a collaborative approach, where you have a meeting of the minds and solve a problem, you generally come out better on the other side of that solution rather than someone being really ticked off about feeling like they've been steamrolled. Yeah. Sometimes that's unavoidable, but in most cases, I think I'm able to be part of that process. So we at least have a win-win or as best of a win-win situation as possible. Helps the long-term think, relationship. Yeah. I was just going to say, do you think that that's built relationships and you kind of answer the question there by itself, but with it, relationships inside of your team, relationships with other contractors, relationships in the industry, like any any relationship that that hasn't helped? Yes, there are a few because some folks, I don't want to put labels on on anybody or anything, but yeah, sometimes I've dealt with people that they're always the smartest person in the room. They're always right. They can't listen to you know another perspective, and yeah. so it doesn't change the way I approach it. I still try for that path, but right. sometimes right. you know just it just just doesn't work. And, but yeah. at least I know that I have tried that approach, and if it doesn't come out great, then it's probably come out better than if had I not used that approach. Yeah. And that's really also be an indicator of somebody who you may not want to be in relationship with anymore. Yes. Yes. Yeah. You do enough, you do enough deals and you start picking and choosing pretty quick. (laughs) It it takes a while to learn that. At least it did for me. Yeah. Yeah. Well, maybe we'll jump into some of that here in a minute. Um, You know, Barry, I think that we're already like just a couple minutes in here into some pretty deep stuff, but you know, you being an industry disruptor, wanting to do things differently, collaborative, like that's not what I hear, you know, hard driving, you know, GC saying a lot. It's, it's, you know, got to get the project done on, on time, you know, all this very, very hard line efficiency stuff that you're talking about. I love what you said underneath that is that that doesn't put that stuff to the side. You still have to get projects done on time and be efficient and I just think that uh, what you've done is that you've had a perspective of people through the process. You've been able to to be aware. Where do you think that that comes from? Is that is that from someone not being able to see you in a project, or is that that's the way you were raised? Like, where does that come from? I'm not sure, honestly. I just know that I'm wired that way, and uh, I don't know that I learned it. I'm just wired that way. Yeah, I guess. Well, simple answer. Simple answer. It, It just be, be, be collaborative. I think that uh, not only do I agree with you, but I think that the listener could easily like pass over this and be like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Like be collaborative. But I think it's probably one of the biggest things that has led to your success. Yeah. I mean, I've had some failures along the way, plenty of failures. I always tell folks that when I talk to them, especially those that, that, that I coach with and that, that, uh, the sum of my successes is greater than some of my failures. And I've had some big failures. Yeah. But uh, yeah, the collab- the collaborative approach is 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 two sided, and, and and since we're talking about the general contracting business, it's really important that the subcontractors and suppliers that we work with, by taking the same approach with them, we get a lot more I think benefit out of it, especially right. in long term relationships. They know we're here to 
uh, to help them, even though we're, we're, we, we fail sometimes, but we're, we're here to solve a problem and make it right and uh, treat each other as a team player. And, and, you know, it's just like any kind of family, you have ups and downs, but if you continue to work together, right. you solve problems and it's a long, it's a long-term journey. It's a, it's right. life's a journey. Yeah. I mean, would you say like, I mean, from the relationship perspective, whether it's a GC or just any business listening right now, and they're in the first five years, I mean, they could have some uber success already, but I'm, I'm more so talking tenure, right? So five years or less in business, you're obviously far beyond five years. Would you say that that relationship that you just described, vendor, you, you can even talk employee, subcontractor, looking decades down the road, was it more important than you realized? Like looking back? Yeah. Yes. I've always been this way. So I, I, I have looked back in many situations and, and thought about, well, that came out better than I expected. Maybe sure. as, maybe as well as I'd hoped for, but I also look back and I think, of course, of course, I've had, like I said, a lot of situations that, that didn't really work out like I'd hoped, but it still right. probably came out better. And even though I, th I think it's the right way to approach solving problems, it's again, it's just to how I'm wired. And so right. even if I didn't see as much success, I probably wouldn't change. And I, I might look at what am I doing that I could be better at it, but sure, just the collaborative is, I think is the best way to solve problems. In yeah. Most love that. Well, let's talk about some of those good decisions and bad decisions that you were just kind of hinting at. I'd love to start with a good decision first. What's something that you did inside the business that we can learn from that you would duplicate this over and over and over again, if you had the chance, what is it? So learning when to say no, there's plenty of them, but I'm going to pick that one today. Yeah. Okay. Tell us no. about that. The, uh, the, this had to do with an owner. So I guess I was firing a client and that's, okay. that's an important thing to, to do when the time is right. And we started a project, this is about 10 years ago, and I'd already learned this by then, but about 10 years ago, I had a project that was getting started and there were a lot of site problems on hidden conditions. It was, it was essentially, a, I think it was a dump because you look at the soils report and, and, and. There was no indication that there was any hidden conditions and we go to go to start excavating and then we're finding all kinds of trash and concrete and debris and wow. you know we had, to, we had to put time out here and then stop and say hey mr owner we've got these issues and and their whole posture was no you just need to take care of it you're going to pay for everything and I'm not going to give you time to schedule they were just really really hard line and for about two weeks of trying to work work through with them says look there's no indication this material is here. It's here now. So I don't know if the the, the 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 company that did the investigative work missed it or if something changed since this report was done. So anyway, they just kept trying to pound on us and uh, I decided, you know what, I'm just not gonna just not gonna continue on this this project. So yeah. Uh, hindsight was 2020. I mean a good decision. Yeah, uh, which is 2020. And uh, knowing what happened after we decided to not do the project is that you know it's a small, small world. We hear what's going on and the folks ended up doing the project was they had a really, really terrible experience. Yeah. And so yeah, that's an yeah, example dodged, of a good decision. Yeah. Yeah. He dodged a bullet on that. The principal underneath, like you said, is learning how to say no. What do you think gave you the ability in that moment to walk away? Like to, and it didn't, it didn't sound like you were, you know, emotionally charged. It wasn't like in a hot, you know, heated conversation and a debacle. And you said, you know, forget this, I'm out. It sounds like over the course of a couple of weeks, you worked through practically trying to make it work through your collaborative approach. And then you decided practically mm -hmm. this isn't a good fit for us. How did, how, how did you come to the table with that level of poise? Like what can the listener be working on right now to build this that you had? Well, I had, fortunately and unfortunately, I had the experience because I've been burned before. You know, it's like a, it's like a movie you've seen, right? A commercial okay. you've seen. And it showed all the signs of, 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 of driving towards a cliff. And so Yep. I thought that I'd tried everything to keep, you know, keep the wheels on, but they just weren't going to have any of it. So, yeah. so it's experience. And I was very confident where, where I was headed and decided that, you know, we're just not a good fit. And, and essentially they were agreeable and that's what we did. And they went a different, down a different path. And yeah. so experience. yeah, confident I think in my past experience. Exactly. Yeah. I, you, I, the example that you gave there that really stuck out to me was that you had the indicators, right? So you knew as you were passing these mile markers that like, wait a second, the mm -hmm. cliff's coming up. <laughs> we, we, should, we should not keep going. And so I think that 
the most important <clears throat> thing that I think that this show offers is the learning of the indicators mm -hmm. that you just That's described. And so, if, yeah, if someone can listen to you or any of our other episodes and go, man, okay, so that's what I should be watching out for. And then boom, 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 that turns into a now good decision or keeping away from a bad decision because it could have gone the other way. You could have kept going and it would have been maybe a bad decision. And the thing about it too is that, and I've learned before that, and that decision was really helpful to our subcontractors because we've been involved with projects leading up to that one. And there's been some sense. We've had some bad actor owners that right. they start, they get near the end of the job and they want to negotiate pennies on the dollar to you know release the retainage hopefully most of the listeners here are familiar with the general contracting business but it puts our general puts our puts our subcontractors and suppliers in a bad position yeah. because they're relying on on us as well to help make the good decisions to help protect them and so yeah yeah i saw that coming and it was just going to be a problem all the way around for me and my team and then all the subs that to work with us yeah yeah i think that there's just a lot i mean we could probably discuss this ins and outs the entire podcast you know as far as how you got there but a quick takeaway here a little recap for the listener is that they should they should be paying attention to indicators <clears throat> and I'll, specifically in this the indicators in here because i can i can relate you know whether you're dealing with a client that is kind of hard line like you said a little bit bull bullheaded if you're dealing with somebody that's like uber detailed like so much so to where it's not just detailed it's now complaining it's like un unsatisfied completely always forever i mean those are indicators that you can you can catch up on whether it's a construction project or if you're doing you know a podcast with somebody <laughs> it doesn't matter they make themselves known but you just got to know you know what you're looking for and i think that you and i both have given some some good indicators here and oftentimes it's hard to say you know what i don't need this because you're you're giving up money, you're giving up business, you're giving up, you know, maybe work for your team or for your subcontractors. Speak to that for just a quick second here, Barry. How do you say no to money when even though my, maybe it's hard, you know, and you're like, oh, I can I can figure it out, I'll deal with it. But rather you say no, what, what gives you the power to do that? I think it's back to that experience. It's, uh, money sometimes becomes that shiny thing. You've probably heard chasing the shiny thing is is, is generally problematic. And so uh, we're obviously we're in business to make money, and and we need projects that are profitable so we can keep right paying and paying our team. And of course, I I like to make some money as well. And so, right. but when 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 those warning signs are on, that warning light on the dashboard's on, blinking, right? <laughs> is whatever amount of money is on the other side of that finish line is almost never worth the the brain damage it, it takes to get there because along the way it becomes a distraction generally and it takes you away takes me away at least from looking and listening for those good opportunities with customers that care about us yeah. uh, so by pursuing that not only do i have to deal with a problem on the back end to get paid for it I, I may have likely missed some good opportunities along the way that are much much better yeah a lot of a lot of lost opportunity or opportunity cost as they say mm -hmm. uh, when when you're distracted that's for sure Barry, what about a bad decision? Something that you did that uh, you would warn us, stay away from this. What, what, what can we learn from? Well, there was a time about, I guess we'd been in business six or seven years and I uh, decided that I was going to continue to grow and I grew too fast and I had these aspirations. I'm going to do this and and uh, grew too fast. I had problems. Didn't have a good plan in place to hire. Didn't have a good plan in place to uh, with systems and processes to handle the added work. Right. Pretty much you name it. We just weren't prepared, even though... I personally felt I could do it, which I could do it, but I had more than people than just me and we just didn't have the infra infrastructure in place to handle it. So yeah, I started having problems and pulled back. And and then since then, our growth has been much more steady, always creating and, and, and improving systems and processes to help us manage that growth. Yeah. Growing too say fast, to the, to yeah, I was going to say, now obviously the growing, growing, yeah, the growing too fast piece is, you know, I think a lot of people listening are like, oh, man, just give it to me. I'll figure it out. You know, just give me the business. I'll figure it out. And, and for somebody who hasn't experienced that, like you and I have, and it, it's not a very good feeling really, it's not a matter of like, oh, I can figure it out. I can, I'm, 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 you know, I can get in there, build a team. Like, it's not like that. <laughs> it is like drowning is what it is. Um, mm -hmm. And it sucks. So speak to the guy right now who hasn't experienced this 
kick in the face where you lose all teeth in that one kick because <laughs> it because he's, he's thinking oh i got it like you know barry Chaz, you guys you know you guys can't handle it i'm just i'm just bigger faster stronger than you i'll handle it give me the business what is he missing that that you and i have perspective and wisdom and i mean that's probably obvious but I'm, I'm one of those five and a half pound, I'm always working for five and a half pounds of stuff with a five pound bag. So I get it. Yeah. I, I still do that when I can. Yeah. But I'm a lot more careful because of those problems that I had. And, and even though I think I can, if it were just Barry Wurzel, I could, and it was only me involved and it was a little tiny thing that I can manage, I can probably do it. Yeah. But when you're talking about a business like most of us have, or are involved with where you have many people, you right. have different customers, you have subcontractors, suppliers, and suppliers, and just all those moving parts yeah. in our business because we make our money outside our walls. It's not like everything is within these four walls, like on a shop table or right. computer screen, what have you. Yeah. We have to rely so heavily on the the team that's not within reach, if you will. You got to get in a truck and drive over there generally. Right. Yeah. Of course, this happened also before tools like we have now like Procore is one of them probably heard of that where yeah. we have cloud-based systems where if I want to see a project I just get on the computer and I can click and see pictures right so it might be a little, little less complicated now but I think it would be a problem so need systems and processes good people yeah. coaching and just the, just you just need systems and processes and folks to help you manage it they're 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 aligned with you both morally, ethically, yeah. they under they get the mission, the vision that we're we're striving for. And when you're when everything's in alignment, you know all the systems and processes in place, then it's in a place where it could succeed, has the opportunity to succeed. Without yeah. it, yeah. How do you how do you go back and forth on the got to be prepared, build systems, and be ready to? We don't have anything in place. Just jump. We'll figure it out. Because neither because you can't just be solely in one camp. It's, mm -hmm. it's a little bit of both, right? Like you got to take risks. You got to jump before maybe you're fully ready, mm -hmm. but you can't, you can't do it so fast, so quick that you have nothing in place. Like <laughs> what's that balance? It's well, you, you've been there. It's, it's some, sometimes it's instinctive when I was younger and we were smaller, I had less systems in, pro in place. So I probably took more risks than I should have, or maybe needed to I still take risks now, of course, but. We have more more folks here, but more systems and processes. So we have a, a broader, you know, deeper and broader foundation to pull from. I generally start putting systems, processes, and, and safeguards in place before I need it, uh, even though it takes some resources, time, and, in, in terms of time and money. Almost every single time, though, it's 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 paid off because when an opportunity comes, and they usually do, I say, hey, I'm really in a good place to do this because I've already done that to be ready for this. Right. Or some derivative of this. So yeah, I think just learning that it's it it's you almost can't ever be too far ahead, right? Get ahead of everything. Get ahead of even if you haven't, you don't have that thing that you need to be ahead for. Right. Plan. Work the what's it? Plan the work and work the plan. Yeah, absolutely. I agree with you, and I think that you know that opportunity train, as you mentioned, it comes around repeatedly, and oftentimes the bigger you get. It comes around more often, mm -hmm. uh, and a lot of times you, you're we're saying no to to those as well because maybe it's not the right fit and goes back to what you said earlier. But the the being ready is important. And so here's let me let me keep us in the same vein, but I want to flip it on its head here. You've got a guy listening right now who's building a business, and it could be you know a small business. He hasn't hit a million yet, or he could be even five or ten million on the residential side, or maybe even 10 or 20 on the commercial side. And, you know, like they haven't really spent time on the systems. They haven't really spent time on leadership or, you know, core values or, or what, you know, whatever the, the, the systems inside of the team are. Right. What do you say to that guy? Who's like, man, I wish I know I Barry, I know you're speaking the truth. I know I need to, but I don't have time. What do you say to that? Mm. Well, that's the lack of planning is a problem. That's where we usually run into problems. So by not having the time, not making the time, as we learn, we get older, time management is, is, is a real conundrum at times. Yeah. You probably heard this saying, we all have 
we never seem to have as much time, but we all have all the time there is. That's right. <laughs> so if you're going to be, if you think you need to do something and you don't have time to do it, then you really got to, in my opinion, you got to back off and figure out, okay, what needs to, what needs to be given up right. so I can plan to do that thing. Cause if I don't plan to do that thing, yep. that thing is going to become a problem. Yeah. And especially if it's a customer or someone that uh, has some real expectations of your performance, you just, like I said, you're going to be beating your head against the wall. It's going to be, it's going to be nine and a half times out of 10. It's going to be a problem. I, 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 yeah. I bet I'd put money on it. Yeah. The, the big takeaway here for the listener that I'm, and you know, tell me if you want to add anything, Barry, is that not only as you're growing, that you've got to build sustainable systems, which includes you talk about processes and people. So there's hiring, there's team building, there's leadership, there's people training, product training, process training. I mean, there's just stuff that goes into people and hiring. And then of course the actual, you know, SOPs, they're like, okay, step one, step two, step three for this person and step one, step two, step three for this person. And that takes time, money, effort, but you're saying not only do it, but oftentimes if you can just pull back just a little bit, especially if you're growing fast, if you're listening right now and you're growing fast, it's probably an indicator that you should pull back even more, not necessarily pull back from the growth, but make sure that some of these things are in place. Barry, would you add anything to this? No, I agree with that. It's okay. It, well, I, well, I will add that it is okay to pull back. Pulling back is not a, is not a, a sign of a failure or a sign that you're going the wrong direction. It actually takes Good. more strength because of the wisdom. Well, if you haven't gained it yet, you will. Just, it really takes more strength and courage to do that. And to get your you know backyard in order, if you will, to be ready to then okay, I bumped up against the wall. Um, I'm starting to have some you know some problems here. The warning lights on my dashboard are starting to flash. I'm gonna back off. Let me figure out what what the problem is here. Let me, let me get some systems in place or fix that thing, and then then we'll start to accelerate again. And then almost always you'll be in a much better place. And customers and subcontractors that we're responsible for will react accordingly and be much happier. Yeah. Yeah. They, they, and they see that over the course of time as a history that you're building with them, whether they recognize it or not, <clears throat> they start to, they start realizing that uh, you do things in a certain way. And then, like you said, they'll fall in line with that. I want to move on here, Barry, to our speed round. I want to get you in here to some, to some more practical questions, but my, my first question is around KPIs. You've got obviously several companies. If you could only pick one thing to track forever and ever, what would that be? Pick one thing to track. Mm -hmm. That's a tough question. I guess cash flow. Yeah, uh, cash flow and profit. I guess the the, the two are, are independent. They're in. They're, they're what? They're tied together, but they're mutually independent. I guess is the right term. Yeah, but uh, track much more than just that because that sounds like we're just money driven. And but you got to have the money stuff in order in order to pay the bills yeah. and, and keep growing. So that would probably be it. But we track yeah. many more than that. Yeah, of course. Is there is there something else that pops into your brain as far as something else that you're that you're tracking that you wanted to say? Yes, we track quality control. We track progress on the schedule. I mean, these, all all these things are probably what most companies do. Definitely, sure. all of them, I'm sure, do as a gain experience. But we have a weekly updating of our tracking process, so we I can see numerically how we're doing, both on schedule. How we're doing? Do, in other words, we turn all of our pay applications in on time. So I get I get a report. Right. What that that's monthly. I get a report on that, and there gets a a number assigned to it, and our bonus program is tied to it for the superintendents and PMs, and and so I can see that and I track that over time, so we can see if we're getting better or not. So pay applications that that's also an indicator that we can pay subs on time. So if we're doing we're getting pay applications submitted to owners, and we're following up. We get paid, and we've got the money there to pay subs timely, which is what they want to need. Right. Quality control, safety, cleanliness and job sites, organization of job sites. I will say there's a long list, but there's about 20 items that we that we track pretty closely. Yeah, it's awesome. Mm -hmm. Barry, what would you say as far as like a book or a resource that you'd recommend for business owners trying to grow? Hmm. A bunch, I've written a bunch of books. Well, one of them is, especially for the younger group, is if you it's the, it's the, it's the, uh, when I, I want to say it's called Opportunity Meets the Monkey. Okay. That guy, but it's about yeah. essentially don't take on stuff that's not your responsibility. Yeah. It's a real thin book. Monday Morning Leadership is another one. It's a real thin book. I'm okay. familiar with any of these. 
it's it's an easy read. It took, probably take about an hour. A lot of good a lot of good messages in that in that book. I read a book called Innovation. I think this is the name of the book. I can send you this list if you like. Sure. But it's about, I was about two years ago, I read it. It's all about innovation. Okay. Uh, it talks about, especially in our industry, it's got a few topics in our industry, which is really interesting. So it kind of helps, helps keep your mind open to a change and that, you know, you just yeah. you need to always have a, a, a finger on the innovation space. Right. Especially in our industry, construction doesn't change much. It right. just doesn't change much. And it's hard to, that the, the avenues for innovation are limited. It's not like other areas of, 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 the, of the world's operation. But uh, yeah. anyway, innovation. But, I'll think of a few more. No, that's okay. Those are all great. We'll put them in the show notes as well for the listener mm-hmm. and they can they can grab those. What, what do you think about intentionally networking or masterminding with other entrepreneurs? Oh, I think it's absolutely necessary, especially if you have peers you can network with. I mean, we network, my wife, Robert and I network with subcontractors, suppliers, folks that we don't do business with, folks that really aren't even in our industry. We network with other general contractors, we network with owners. So it, we, I will hear something or have a conversation with, could be a supplier of a certain product and think, sure. oh, wow, I didn't, I didn't know that that was being developed or, right. or uh, that's a good way to do that. And I'll be talking to a developer or, or an owner and hear of a of, of something that I didn't know anything about. And so not only is it a form of education for me, because I like to learn, because uh, there's a ton that I don't know. And I know I don't know what I don't know. Right. And so those relationships not only help bring business and business opportunities, it helps educate. And and I'm a firm believer that we we need to, well, Rob and I are both a member of BNI, and they have a saying calling basically paying it forward okay but their actual saying is called giver's gain and so we need to always be here not just to learn and to serve ourselves but also how can we help whoever it is we come in contact with maybe, you know, maybe we have a referral for them maybe we have a right. uh, a name of someone that can solve a problem for them so it's by doing that we can always maintain some level of two-way opportunity and two-way helping yeah, that's a long answer. <laughs> no, it's a great answer. Even just to that last point, <clears throat> I find that even inside of our mastermind group, Gathering the Kings, you've got you've got uh, guys that have just passed over that one, two, three million dollar mark, and you got, mm-hmm. you know, we've got a, a couple of big GCs, but uh, some some bigger guys. Let's just say it like that. And then you have you have different things that come out in situations, but a lot of times what you just said is like that give 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 mentality, whether it's the, the, the little guy, the, the million dollar guy, given energy and inspiration and insight of just battle wounds to the guy that's been around for a while, or the guy that's been around for a while saying, Hey, here's, here's something that you may not be seeing around the corner. And it's just as much life. What I've learned for that guy to be able to give in that moment, um, mm-hmm. rather than receive, he actually is receiving. Uh, it's, it's like an undertone receiving though. He gets mm-hmm. to give from, from wisdom. He gets to give from experience, just like we get to do right now on the show. It, it's a little bit, when you really put it in that perspective, it's a little bit selfish that we get to be here today with each other, learning and growing everything from each other and giving, but the beneficiaries are the listeners or the small guy in the other example. So a um, lot, of, lot of good ways to give, 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 as you said. So I appreciate that perspective. I got a question for you about family. <clears throat> There's this energy around an entrepreneur and being obsessed with his business, and but yet he's married and and yet he has kids and like all these things and all these dynamics and and they they pull on each other a little bit, or maybe they don't have to. Is kind of what I'm like pressing into. And so, Barry, how have you facilitated this environment for obsession in your businesses, but yet also obsession with each other in your marriage, with your kids, your family? Like, how do you keep it all on point? Well, it's definitely an art. It's definitely a work in progress. It's definitely not a science. Well, it work wise because we both work in the same building here. We, and our offices used to be right next to each other. And uh, when we got a chief of staff, which is not a position you don't have in, in, in our industry, but when she, so she moved down the hallway as soon as we got a chief of staff here on the Wurzel side. So we have, we have our sandboxes and we know, we know where the edge of the sandbox is. It doesn't yeah. mean we don't talk about problems and doesn't mean I don't know what's happening with the first, with the service company. And it doesn't mean she doesn't know what's happening with Wurzel, but right. we do talk, we talk at home. 
you know, talk when we go out on a you know, day supper or whatever. But yeah, we, when it comes to decision making and we stay in our sandbox, we don't add, and, and typically if we're, if we're venting, the other person will just listen. And uh, I know I will say, are you, would you like an opinion or some feedback? Or only just to listen. And usually it's, no, I just want you to listen. Uh-huh. So, Knowing those rules and, and staying within the sandbox has really been uh, critical, might be too strong a word, but necessary to yeah. remain or to keep a balance in work versus home life. Yeah. Yeah. I think that those are great. The The language that Julie and I use are lanes. So she's got her lane and I've got mine. And sometimes, sometimes they cross over. But generally speaking, if I'm trying to go 100 miles an hour and she's trying to go 100 miles and, and we're in the same lane, it's like, it doesn't work, you know? So I like the sandbox analogy. We know where the edge is or we know where the lane kind of begins, mm -hmm. but, but if, if we're going to go fast, we, we gotta, we gotta know and trust that the other person has that sandbox under control. Uh, yeah. so there's a lot of, a lot of dynamics there, even though maybe you're a little bit more separated than just doing everything together. I still think that there's a lot of benefit there. I got one last question here for you, Barry. You ready? Yes, sir. If you could whisper in the younger Barry's ear, what would you say? Trust your instinct, trust your gut. It, it mainly has to do with getting involved with a bad project or a, or a bad actor owner. Sure. You're, I, 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 there's a book I read, just asking about a book, and I can't think of the book right now, but it talked about instinct and how unoften, that's a word, we, 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 we trust what we're feeling, because you know something that's just... And something doesn't feel right. And if you go against it, then you have a problem. It's like, I should listen to my gut. So yeah. listen to my gut and instinct more. Because in my early years of being in business, I, I wish I did because I made some, a lot of mistakes not listening to it. I yeah. listen to it more now yeah. than I used to. Yeah, it kind of goes back to that, uh, that fire that burned us or the cliff, the indicators that we start recognizing the cliff comes mm -hmm. up. All those things can, can teach the, the intuition or that gut instinct, sometimes it's just, it just is. And you just have that feeling, right? Maybe it's a download from heaven even, you know, but like, we just got to listen to those, those circumstances sometimes. Cause I agree with you. I think that those, those are moments where, and even sometimes I can think of where, where some of those indicators or some of that gut instinct has come through my wife and I've ignored it <laughs> and I'm still had a, a, a bad time. What were you going to say to that? Well, as I say, I, I forgot to mention that. Yeah, my I've always felt that Robin's intuition is better than mine. And so I'll often ask her questions. Hey, what do you think of this? Or I got this thing coming up. What, what's your thought on that? Had her involved in certain interviews, for example. So Because she has different perspective. I think women in general do than men. Maybe it's just my wife has a better intuition than me. But I do know that it's a blind spot for me or can be. And so I've got a resource over there. And uh, I'll definitely tap into that. Was it so Roosevelt that said, I use all the brains I have and all I can borrow? I think yeah. you said that. So, so true. That's, yeah. Yeah. And, and why wouldn't you? It would be, it would be egotistical not to. Mm -hmm. So, well, Barry, you've been, you've been humble. You've been, you've been clean as far as like, here's how to do it. Like you've just been super straightforward with us. I love the, the humility and just, I guess, just genuine approach really is probably the best way to describe you and our interactions with you here today. So I'm just so appreciative. How can the listener find you? So same thing, your, your, G, your GC company, your service company, how can we find you if we want to do business with you? Or if we want to pick your brain as another entrepreneur, how can the listener find you? Probably email me. Okay. You want me to give my email? Yeah, you can give it to give it here, here and we'll put it in the show notes as well. Okay. Yeah. My email address is barry.wurzel at wurzelbuilders.com. And I can, I definitely can share some things of what I did that were not good. Yeah. And yeah, one thing that, that, that history does is it repeats itself. Yeah. And a lot of us have, it's hard to learn from history. And I'm sure I was that way when I was younger too. Think, ah, I can handle that. I got, I got this one. Right. So history has a tendency to repeat itself. So I have some, I have some wisdom that I can share to help, help folks stay out of trouble. Love that. Well, Barry, you've been incredible. Blessings to you and Robin and your teams, your family, all that you're putting your hand to in 2023. Thank you for being here. Blessings to you, Chaz. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening to Gathering the Kings today. I hope that you were able to pull out a few nuggets to go apply into your business right away. More importantly, though, I hope that you're realizing that it takes more to be successful than just being by yourself, doing it all on your own, carrying the weight all by yourself. 
what I have realized not only in my own journey from multiple businesses and multiple different industries and now interviewing literally over two or 300 other very successful seven, eight and nine figure business owners is that it's tough to do it alone. And so Gathering the Kings literally exists to bring together successful entrepreneurs. In fact, we are putting together 1000 Kings specifically who are grateful, but not done. We're intentionally assembling kings who fight tooth and nail for their business, family, and communities. And here's what we believe, that in the pursuit of excellence in those areas, that it ignites within us the responsibility to govern power and forge a lasting legacy. So if that relates and, and resonates with you, and you know that you need people around you, sharp, qualified, other very successful business owners, I want you to go to gatheringthekings.com. I want you to take a look at what we're doing and see if it makes sense for you to be part of our pursuit to 1,000 Kings. Talk soon.